I am so thankful for you all being here and being a part of this. And I am even more thankful for Phil sharing this gift with us and for being willing to share in so many ways with the people of St. Luke's and uh, the people of uh, Ingleside. Did I get it? Got it. Um, and your family, uh, you just share your gifts everywhere. Um, and so I'm very thankful for that and um, glad to um, have you in our midst to help us through this trying time. Um, so Phil, I'm a hand, well, okay, so a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to keep you muted the entire time until we get to the end of um, Phil's talk. So if you have questions, you can write them in the chat box or you can jot them on a sheet of paper at your house or however you keep track of things like that. Um, so you can use the chat feature here, but questions will be answered at the end of the presentation in the chance that maybe your question gets answered in the midst of the presentation. So we'll just keep um, all participants muted except for Phil during the presentation and then questions and answers or questions and musings will be offered at the end of the presentation. And uh, I think that's the only um, thing that I need to say that is important. Phil, did I miss anything? Nope, I think that should do it. All right, I'm gonna mute myself also and um, turn it over to you. Thank you, Sam. Can you share? Jessica, can you respond? Can you see the screen? No. Is that a yes or a no? See the screen. Okay. 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 So just one quick word about uh, how we got to uh, to this uh, point, which is uh, that <clears throat> I was uh, invited by the head of the men's group out here at Ingleside. Uh, to uh, to talk about the pandemic at some point uh, the uh, the head of the group happens to be a, an ophthalmologist and he uh, he knew that I'd worked previously with the CDC which now is uh, so many decades ago it's almost hard to remember but so I spent the better part of June trying to prepare that and so it seemed at the end of that that uh, that uh, we, and so I presented it on the 4th of July uh, so we didn't have fireworks here we had COVID talk instead uh, but at the end of that, um, other discussions came up about reopening the church. And in the course of that, both uh, Jim Mills and I sort of joined uh, the last meeting of the reopening committee. And it seemed that as we're thinking about our diocesan guidelines and as we're thinking about the interspersing those with our county guidelines and so on, that it made sense to have some sort of common uh, background knowledge base about where we are with and, and, and the other elements uh, uh, that would were essentially the kinds of things that I had already put into this talk. And so um, I volunteered to do that and Jessica kindly agreed to let me uh, try to, to do this for you. So this is the title of the talk, Coronavirus Pandemic 2019, an Epidemiologic Perspective. Hey Phil, uh, we can't see the screen. Oh, you can't see the screen. We cannot. Okay. Okay, that's what I thought I asked you, and that's what I thought you said you could, so. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me see. Where did that go? There it is. I see it. Okay, just a second. Okay, does that look like the first page? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, so I won't repeat what I said. We'll just go from here. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. We'll talk a little bit about what a virus is, specifically a coronavirus and coronavirus related diseases. A little uh, glimpse at the start of the pandemic and then the current status of the pandemic. Then we'll talk about some symptoms of clinical cases, some of the epidemiologic features, prevention, testing, vaccines, treatments, and then sum up by 
looking at some important but as yet unanswered questions and a bit of a gaze into the future. Okay, starting with uh, background. What is a virus? Well, a virus is an infectious agent that contains nucleic acid and a protein. Viruses are not very self-sufficient. They have no means of locomotion. They must be taken into cells essentially to survive. And when they do that, they take over the cellular replication mechanisms and replicate very rapidly. Every two to three hours, they double themselves. And this is about 10 times faster than your average bacteria. So what is a coronavirus? Well, coronaviruses are RNA viruses to be <clears throat> distinguished from DNA viruses. And the particular one we're concerned with today is called SARS-CoV-2. So just to spell that out <clears throat> so it's clear, that stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, which implies, of course, that there has been a coronavirus 1. And there has been. So corona means crown. And so this is an electron mic microgram of the coronavirus. And it's these little spiky points around the outside that's where the coronavirus gets its name. Those are, those are considered spikes and that's part of the crown. And there are in, that, in the coronavirus four fundamental structural proteins that are particularly important. And one of them, and you've probably seen this mentioned in the press, is called the spike. And the other is in the inside of the coronavirus, and that is this nucleocapsid. They're important. These two proteins are particularly important because this is what the scientists are really focusing on. This is what they are using to target, to try to make the diagnostic test, so identify who has it. This is what the antibody tests are targeted against. This is what the vaccines are targeted against, the, the RNA or the DNA or whatever in these. So. so what human diseases does coronavirus cause? Well, we probably all had coronavirus at one time or another. The common cold uh, is, is the main reason that we probably have. And there are four common coronavirus types that cause altogether one fifth of all the colds that we see circulating around the world. However, the, the downside of coronaviruses is, is this serious respiratory disease epidemics that they cause. And there have been three coronaviruses that each independently have caused uh, their own separate epidemic, essentially. Those three outbreaks are shown here, the syndrome, the year, the location, and so on. So SARS-CoV-1 first made its appearance on the scene in 2003 in Guangdong, China. It is believed to have come from the bats and traveled into the civet cats and from there into humans. There were only about 8,000 cases identified from this outbreak and it, it had a fairly substantial case fatality ratio. 10% of those 8,000 people died. Then in 2012, MERS, CoV-2, and that stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, made its ugly appearance in Saudi Arabia. This virus also uh, or originated in excuse me, in, in uh, bats, and, but its primary uh, mode of ex uh, exposure to humans came through camels. Uh, only 2,500 persons were, uh, were, became cases for this, but it had a case fatality ratio of over a third. So it was, it was quite a deadly disease. And that gets us down to the current SARS-CoV-2. Now we talk about the disease as being COVID-19, the virus itself that causes the disease is SARS-CoV-2. So that's the sort of the definition and the nomenclature of this. So this started this past year in Wuhan, China. Its uh, origin again was bats. Its intermediate reservoir is pangolins, which I hadn't even heard of before, but thus far, and I'll show you a picture in a second, but thus far it has um, infected over 13 million people worldwide and has a case fatality ratio overall of about 4.4%. Now, just for comparison, you can say, well, what, what happens with flu? You know, because that's the thing we're all sort of familiar with, we've almost all certainly had. So by comparison, influenza is estimated to affect just in the United States each year, about 20 to 50 million people. And among those, we expect 20 to 50,000 persons a year 
to, to die from it. So th it, it's a huge deep disease every year and it sort of sits in the background and happens. Uh, and it's, it's important that we think about that in the context of this potential wave of flu that's gonna be superimposed this fall on top of our um, coronavirus epidemic. Now the case fatality ratio, fortunately for flu, usually is only about a 10th of a percent. So one in every thousand persons. And if you divide the, the uh, uh, 20 to 50,000 persons into the, the, the million, the 20 to 50 million, that's exactly the number that you're gonna sort of get. Okay, so this is a picture of a bat. You've probably all seen them, maybe not quite that up close and personal. And this is the pangolin, also noted as the spiny anteater. Now this is a bush meat animal and it made its way into one of the markets in Wuhan. And in China, it is, um, I don't know that it's revered, but it's considered to have very tasty meat. But you can also see it has all of these um, sort of scales and they take the scales and they grind them up and they take the powder and they actually put it on their food. So it's, it's a dual purpose uh, uh, food for, for the people that are into that sort of thing. So let's look a little bit at the start of the epidemic, the pandemic now. The first case uh, was reported the 29th of December of last year in Wuhan. It was in Hubei province and the, a month, month or so later, the first case appeared in the U.S. and it came onto the West Coast, presumably directly from China. It was in the state of Washington and it was in a person who had, was Chinese uh, origin. He had just returned from visiting his family in Wuhan. Ten days later, the first case in Italy showed, and, and this uh, occurred uh, as a result of contact with two Chinese visitors who were uh, in touristing in Rome. The 19th of February I've highlighted because there was a particularly important event in the spread of the virus in Italy. It was the Champions League soccer game in Milan. And we're gonna, we're gonna look at that in a little bit more detail because it's just interesting. A couple days later, the first two cases in Lombardy were diagnosed. And about a week later, the first case uh, was diagnosed in the U.S. on the East Coast in New York City. So that appeared to have been seeded by, by Europe. So all of this seemed to have started in China. It went both East and West and got to us, to our two coasts by a, a rather different route. Okay, so this is a, a picture of the soccer game held on the 19th of February in Milan at their 40,000 seat stadium or thereabouts. This is the two clubs that are, are playing and you can see the, the blue, which is the, uh, the local um, uh, team from, from Italy playing a Spanish team. So it was Atalanta from Bergamo in Italy versus Valencia, the uh, Valencia team in the Champions League game. It was the biggest soccer game in the history of the Atalanta team. One third of the population of Bergamo attended this game, traveling there by bus, mostly by bus, some by car, a total of 40,000 persons. And excitingly for them, Atalanta won, it was four to one. Now in the midst of this, as Italians are wont to do, there was a lot of yelling and hugging and kissing. And did I say yelling and hugging and kissing? And of course that happened after every score. And so with four scores, that's a lot of yelling and hugging and kissing. Well, the result of that was a biologic bomb. The first cases were diagnosed less than a week after the game. Over a third of the Valencia team became infected. Five of the Atalanta staff actually died as a result of this. And within five weeks, 7,000 persons in the province of Bergamo had been infected and 1,000 had died. As of the 1st of July, Italy had just under a quarter of a million infections and about 35,000 deaths from COVID. Now, Italy, as a result of their shutting things down, is actually uh, on the, is, has, has a very muted COVID problem at this point in time. Their, their extreme measures of sheltering in place, it seems to have worked. So the, these are fairly stable numbers now. They're not accumulating much more. Now I wanna take you to uh, an event that actually is, is the thing that really got the politicians' attention. And that is a scientific paper that was, that came out of the UK and really ended up 
directing both US and UK strategies. This came out of the Washington Post on the 17th of March, and it was about the press conference that was held the day before of Prime Minister, uh, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, in which he was announcing the findings of a study from the Imperial College London COVID-19 response team. And the study was a modeling study, and this is what they found. They found that uh, the curves that you see here are their estimates of what would happen, black for the UK and uh, blue for the US, if we did nothing. And that tallies to over a half a million UK deaths by their model estimates and over 2 million US deaths. So as I said, that got the politicians' attention. So they also tried to predict what would happen if we exercise the practice of mitigation, that is social distancing, perhaps uh, shut, uh, stay in place, uh, stay home on ICU beds, which was a major concern. So this is what uh, their estimates were. And the, the black curve that you see here is the do nothing curve. And the blue curve down at the bottom here is the, if you do, full mitigation. In this case, they define that as social, or case isolation, home quarantine, and social distancing for everybody above the age of 70. So this is where the term flattening the curve first appeared. And this model predicts that full mitigation would essentially cut the ICU bed surge by two thirds. And in turn, that would cut deaths by half. So that doesn't make the problem go away, but having the problem certainly is a major of improvement over what was being predicted. So uh, what has happened uh, in the pandemic so far? So let's look at some graphs of the daily cases and deaths uh, in the world. Uh, this is the uh, straight out of yesterday's uh, Worldometer information uh, website. Daily new cases have continued to climb and are going, uh, if not exponentially upward, it certainly very rapidly upward linearly. And we have over 13 million total cases thus far. In terms of deaths, we had a peak earlier and toward the end of the beginning of May, that has flattened out a bit, but suggests at this point that we're going to begin to rise. And we certainly know there have been uh, continue to be large numbers of deaths, uh, uh, cases going up and, and the deaths follow the cases by typically a couple of weeks. Thus far, 213 countries around the world have been affected by this. So it's really a true world pandemic. So let's look briefly at the same kind of curves for cases and deaths in the US. Here you see that we have now something over 3.3 million total cases. These are daily. Uh, cases done as a sort of a moving seven day average. And you see, obviously, we, we hit a peak uh, in April and then things were looking to go in the right direction, but things have since completely turned around and we're, we're sort of headed straight north with all of this. Uh, deaths, on the other hand, also peaked a couple of weeks after the, uh, the uh, beginning of May uh, and have continued to go down, but there is a distinct sense that the curve has begun to make its turn northward here as well. And as I said, we think that these, these things uh, follow, the deaths followed by a couple of weeks, the, the case counts. And we're now at something uh, uh, also above 135,000 deaths due to this. So what's the take home message or messages from this little background section? Well, the first is that coronaviruses are a new nemesis for us. We've had three major outbreaks in the past 20 years. It's about once every 10 years now. I think we can predict we're likely to have more in the future. SARS-CoV-2 is highly infectious and it is rapidly spreading worldwide. To date, more than 13 million persons have been infected and over 570,000 persons have died. Okay, let's look a little bit at some of the symptoms of the clinical cases. When COVID-19 first appeared, the feeling was, well, gee, this is just an upper respiratory disease and a lung disease. Maybe a bad one, but still an upper respiratory tract lung disease. As it turns out, the more that we've seen, 
the more we realize it's, it's much more of a systemic disease. It affects blood, levels, blood vessels, it affects the heart, it affects the kidneys, and it affects the digestive tract. Truly a multi-system disease. What are the symptoms of clinical cases? Well, you've all seen this a zillion times in the paper. The most common symptoms, that is, fever, a cough that's dry, loss of appetite, fatigue, shortness of breath, a cough that's productive, muscle aches and pains, and then this unusual symptom of loss of smell and taste, which actually is the most specific. If you develop a, a sudden loss of smell or, a smell or taste, I encourage you to look out for the other symptoms and consider seeing your, your, your doctor with that. But it's not the common, common symptoms that are so uh, painful in this at the moment. I mean, they, these are common and they happen to a lot of people, uh, both those that don't have COVID, but certainly those that do. It's the emergence of these uncommon and severe symptoms that's really capturing people's attention. There's something called a cytokine storm where essentially your immune system uh, goes into a sort of a kamikaze attack. There's multi-system failure. Basically, when your lungs begin to be unable to uh, bring the oxygen necessary to oxygenate the rest of your body, then your other organs in the body that are not being properly oxygenated begin to go into, into failure. And as that one of those cascades into another, you end up with this total, total body multi-system failure. Septic shock is, means that you've got bacterial infection in the body. And although this starts out as a viral infection because it is a virus, you get superimposed bacterial infection on, on top of the, uh, the uh, viral infection. Unexpected heart conditions, it, 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 uh, it causes many of the same common things that a person that normally has heart disease uh, has, but in people who never previously had heart disease, like congestive heart failure, rhythm disturbances, inflammation of the heart, a, a flat out myocardial infarction and blood clots, the nervous system the same way, strokes, seizures, encephalitis, and even the appearance of the Guillain-Barre syndrome, that ascending paralysis. Uh, Multi-system inflammatory disease has actually been seen in kids too. This is something that you may have seen described as similar to Kawasaki's disease. This seems to be kids five to 10 years old, up to three weeks uh, after they've had even a very mild case. Some of them have died from it. They have uh, rhythm disturbances in their, it's, it's just a, uh, an unusual uh, sort of thing to see. And finally, there's this number seven is, is not is not something that's going to take anybody's life away. It's a prolonged debilitating illness syndrome that's not severe enough to even get you hospitalized. But this is happening in young people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, and people who are uh, world-class athletes. So it's not, it's not a potato couch uh, syndrome, but these people describe this absolute profound debilitation. They, uh, they get up and brush their teeth and that's it. They're done for the day. That's their entire energy store. And the nasty part about it is it's been, seems to be lasting a very long time, up to three months or more so far. It may last longer because that's sort of the end of our observation period at this time. So these are sort of the unusual and uncommon things. Okay, so what are the take home messages from examining these clinical cases? Well, that COVID-19 is a mild disease in most cases, but it can show severe symptoms and affect multiple organs with devastating consequences. The mortality among symptomatic cases worldwide is not anything to be uh, laughed at. It's still over 4%. Okay, what are the epidemiologic features of uh, COVID-19? Uh, this, um, table of epidemiologic characteristics came largely from the experience uh, in, in Wuhan, China, in, where they described the age distribution as largely 87% being in persons who were between 30 and 79 years. It was quite rare to find, find it in kids, and there weren't that many elderly, per, really elderly persons that had it there. 81% uh, were described as mild. Um, took about five days from the time that you were exposed on average to the time that you would start developing symptoms. It appeared to be person-to-person -person contact then via droplets. Uh, now in the last week, uh, the World Health Organization has been taking severe criticism for failing to recognize that it appears that aerosolization, that is the smaller particles, droplets being the big globules that you get when you have a really nasty sneeze, but the aerosolization is something that involves our simple 
pat breathing, breathing. You don't have to sneeze or cough for aerosolization to, to be an issue. And so that presents itself as a, another yet problematic uh, issue for us in terms of trying to prevent the spread. Treatments at the beginning of this, we had nothing more than supportive treatment, that being oxygen and ventilation. We now have some more and we'll talk about other treatments that we can use. And pre prevention was really limited to mitigation, the things that you've heard over and over and over again about social distancing, face masks, and hand washing. I want to describe uh, some of the risk factors for dying, and I'm going to just show this from a, a one or two studies. This is a study done in England called the Open Safely Study that was designed to, to look uh, at and use the uh, primary care electronic health records of the National Health Service in England linked to their hospital death records. And this, so this, this is a study that involved them looking at these records for over 17 million people for a period of about three months. And they identified in those some 5,683 people that died uh, during that time period. And I bring this study to your attention because thus far this is the largest cohort study conducted by any country to date. Now later as more and more cases accumulate and as scientists take hold of the data there will be many more studies like this and they will be uh, ever larger. Okay so this this is the risk factors for death. These are the risk factors here in this uh, column on the left hand side. For every risk factor there has to be a comparison group and then we have over on the right hand side uh, the hazard ratio and I'm going to uh, diverge to just one epidemiologic uh, definition here if you will. A hazard ratio is the ratio of the risk in a group with the risk factor to a comparison group without the risk factor. Okay, it's a relative risk. So if we look here at older age, that is persons above the age of 80 and compare them to people in their 50s, you see that their risk of dying with COVID is 12.6 times higher. Similarly, for people in their 70s compared to people in their 50s, it's about five times higher. And as we go down, uncontrolled diabetes, about 2.3 or four times higher than somebody with no diabetes. Obesity, 2.2 times higher than somebody who's not obese. Male sex versus females, about twofold. There's a deprivation index that they use in England. I don't exactly know how it's contrived, but the most deprived, the be like the lowest socioeconomic persons, for, for example, compared to the least deprived uh, is, a, is about a 1.7 fold increase in risk. Black ethnicity compared to white, 1.7 fold. High blood pressure, which was described originally in the Chinese studies as being a risk factor, turns out that when you control for all the other factors that were available in this particular study from hospital records, if anything, it shows a slight protection to have high blood pressure. And current smoking, Another factor that one would expect since we're dealing with what we thought was a lung disease, we would have thought that would, would uh, compound the problem that you have, but it appears, if anything, again here that never smokers have some slight advantage. I, I, I don't, I have trouble sort of still believing that, and I, uh, but it's not, it's not a particularly strong effect, and I think it certainly merits continuing to look at. Uh, if we look now at vulnerable populations in the United States, and this is through Medicare data, it's looking at uh, not deaths, but looking at COVID hospitalizations. And this is also based on a very large database, over 100,000 hospitalizations in the first five or so months of this year and a Medicare population of over 62 million persons. And it's just three factors, gender, race, ethnicity, and age. And you see that males have a rate that is about 1.3 fold. Uh, it's about, so about 30% higher than the female rate. Um, blacks have by far the highest rates for any ethnicity, and it's about threefold, fourfold higher than, uh, than, uh, than whites. And finally, age, as we saw for the uh, study from the UK, again, the highest uh, rates are by far in the, in the most uh, elderly population. Uh, because I now live in something that is adjacent to a nursing home, of course, I was interested to look at uh, nursing homes in the US. And there are some nearly one and a half million persons in nursing homes in the US, and there are something like 19,000 nursing homes. Well, if you just look at the uh, data below here, the nursing home resident population as of the 1st of June had reported something like 60,000 infections. Unfortunately, 40,000 of those had died. So nursing homes are a particularly um, 
a verse place to be during a pandemic, uh, nursing homes in the U.S. Are, are less than half a percent of the U.S. population, but that half a percent has generated 3.3 percent of the infections and 38 percent of the deaths that have occurred. So it's, it's a very disadvantaged population in all of this. Now, we are not alone in having problems uh, in the, our most vulnerable population being in nursing homes. This is a characteristic not only for us, but for all of these other Western populations that are shown here. In fact, we're doing you know, better than several others for that matter. But we're all, we're all in, a, in a soup here. This is not where we would like to be. Uh, so because we're a church group, I wanted to, uh, to show a couple of slides about outbreaks that have occurred in churches. And so for this first one uh, slide, I want to talk just a bit about the Shinkyoji Church of Jesus, or the SCJ Church, and a cluster of disease, and they're a South Korean church. So this is a huge church. Uh, in fact, they're considered a cult by many in uh, South Korea. They have nearly a quarter of a million uh, pe people who are considered members. They, they do some unusual things. Uh, they worship sitting on the ground. They're not allowed to wear glasses or masks. And uh, un unfortunately, they are encouraged to attend even when they're ill. On the 20th of January, the first positive case was reported in South Korea. Uh, less than a month later, the first positive case was reported in a member of the church. A couple days later, 15 more positive cases were reported. As of March 25th, another month, the church had over 5,000 positive members and the government decided it was time to uh, send them all for testing. Now, the striking thing about this is that more than half of all the cases in South Korea came from this single church cluster. And this is what that looks like graphically. South Korea, as of that point in time, it had 9,137 cases up to here, and, and over half of them were from this, this one church outbreak. Not to be outdone, we're going to look at one outbreak in the U.S., and this is the Skagit County Washington Choir outbreak, uh, dear to my heart. Uh, on March the 10th, 61 of their 122 member choir practiced for two and a half hours. Would that we had that many choir members. During this two and a half hour session, they sang. They sat close, like six to 10 inches apart as, as choir members are wont to do. They shared snacks and they stacked chairs together. A single person uh, at the practice that night had had, had cold-like symptoms for the past three days and he is presumed to have been the index case for this. A day or two later, six more choir members reported being febrile. Uh, uh, less than a week later, 24 other choir members reported flu-like symptoms. And ultimately, 52 of 60, or 87% of the choir members who attended that March 10 practice became ill. Unfortunately, three were hospitalized, and two of those three died. This is what the epidemic curve uh, sort of looked like. So the take home lessons from the epidemiology section here is that older age is by far the strongest risk factor for dying with COVID-19. Nursing home residents are the most vulnerable population we've been able to identify thus far. And in-person church can be bad for your health in pandemic times. Okay, so what can we do about prevention? And what have we learned about prevention? Well. Prevention can be divided into sort of three fundamental approaches. The first being mitigation. And mitigation is an attempt to do primary prevention. It's to try to avoid even being exposed or to prevent getting an infection. Vaccination is an attempt to prevent getting the infection as well. But vaccinations can also be given to simply reduce the severity of the illness. And finally, we have the treatment of cases. You already got the disease, but what we, can we do to, to basically prevent or reduce the likelihood that you're going to have um, really adverse uh, sequelae from this or that your worst case scenario that you actually die from it? So these are our three primary prevention approaches. Uh, mitigation itself, 
uh, can be divided into thinking about what we as individuals can do, and it can be divided into a second component, which is what can public health, what can the government do to help us with. So we, we've heard this uh, a zillion times over that we can social distance, and we should, we should wear our face masks and we should hand wash. Public health can screen us, they can test us, they can isolate us and quarantine us if necessary, and they can trace contacts. So this is our four pictures of what mitigation looks like in restaurants around the world. Uh, in Amsterdam, you can see, I don't know how many restaurants there are that are like this, probably not that many, but uh, you get your, your own little sort of private secluded uh, eating stall. In Milan, they've gone to uh, plexiglass uh, dividers uh, between uh, recipients. In Osaka, they're wearing the face shields. And as you can see, they're, they're able to, um, to drink their drinks. And apparently they are eating their meals successfully by uh, shoving food underneath the face mask. And in Paris, uh, you get your own little uh, cone, I guess, uh, at least in this particular restaurant. So I wanna show you the results of a study uh, designed to look at physical distancing, face mask use, and eye protection to prevent infection. In other words, the different pro main approaches to sort of mitigation. So the purpose of this study was to figure out whether these things worked or not. And to do this, the, uh, the authors combined data from 44 studies that have been conducted in Asia, the Middle East, and North America. Basically, these were studies that were conducted at the time of the previous SARS or coronavirus epidemics back in 2003 and 2012. The results show that if we look at physical distance as a protective factor, the decrease in absolute risk was from 12.8 percent for persons who were not distancing themselves more than a meter or more than about three feet, down to 2.6% for people who did insist on being at least three uh, feet or a meter away from, from people that they were interacting with. So this, in relative terms, is an 82% decrease in your risk. If you look at face masks, the numbers are similar. Absolute risk with no mask of 17.4% drops down to 3.1% for mask wearers, an 85% decrease in risk. Eye protection, again, that's mostly going to be these eye shields or eye goggles. It dropped from an absolute risk of 16% with no eye protection down to 5.5 for wearing eye protection. Again, a 78% decrease. Now, as an epidemiologist, I can tell you that this shows greater physical distance, face mask use, and eye protection all were associated with striking reductions in risk of infection. And again, in epidemiology, we rarely see this profound a difference from, from any of the studies that we do. This, this, these are what we would call home runs. Okay, um, I know that virtually everybody here at Ingleside, and I assume everybody that's not in Ingleside, has faced the problem of how the heck do I get my hair taken care of during uh, COVID times, particularly when we're in uh, shutdown. So this. This, um, this particular slide will help, help you give you one flavor for, for how you might uh, think about this. In Springfield, Missouri, the health, offer, health officer was skeptical about the value of face masks, even though at the time they were uh, required. Two of the stylists working at Great Clips unfortunately tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, 140 clients and six coworkers were traced to being potentially exposed by the working with these two stylists. The health department offered COVID testing to all 146 persons. Only 46 chose to take the test. They were all negative. However, they continued to follow all of these people so that they were uh, followed for at least two or more weeks beyond when they had their interaction with the Great Clips store and none of the 146 contracted COVID-19. The health officer has changed his mind about the value of masks, surprise. Okay, Sweden stands out as a particularly interesting country in all of this uh, epidemic. Uh, they more or less chose to say, we're gonna tough it out, we're going to do nothing. So I wanna show you what doing nothing in Sweden has looked like 
thus far. So, so here is some curves for confirmed COVID deaths rates among four Nordic countries. So these countries are basically very similar in where they live geographically in income in their kinds of habits and, and their social systems that they have. And you see uh, Sweden stands out like a sore thumb here, uh, way off the chart compared to the others. If you look at the cases that have occurred in, in Sweden by age group, you see that again, virtually all of them appear in the above 70 year age group. In fact, 89% of the COVID deaths in Sweden were in persons that were above the age of 70 years. Okay, uh, not to be unfair to the US, I think we should look at what doing something, but doing it badly looks like. Okay, so this is the US compared to uh, some other comparable countries, uh, an amalgam of all of Europe, Canada, and Japan. And uh, even from the beginning, we peaked higher. Uh, we at least had a curve that looked like it was going in the same direction as the other countries, uh, except for Japan. Uh, but then, you know, basically, again, we've, we've headed north. And if you look at this in terms of deaths, uh, we get the same picture. It's not quite as extreme. But that is likely because we haven't felt the effect of, uh, of this extreme surge in cases as yet. So the take home lesson from this particular section on prevention is that mitigation, mitigation works, so keep it up. Okay, let's talk a little bit about testing now. Okay, two basic types of tests that are performed that everybody talks about in the news. The first are diagnostic tests and these tests basically address the simple question of, do you have the virus now? With a big explanation point about the now. They don't tell you whether you had it yes, uh, you know, a week ago. They won't tell you about whether you're going to get it tomorrow or in the future. It's just right now. And the antibody tests, which ask or answer the question, have you ever been exposed to the virus? Okay. Diagnostic tests are all about swabs and sputum. Antibody tests are, are a blood test at this point in time. Okay. So that distinguishes the collection type distinguishes. So the gold standard diagnostic test is what we call a PCR polymerase chain reaction test. It's a molecular test. It amplifies the virus particles up. So even a very small number of particles, perhaps as small as one, two, or three, theoretically and in practice actually can be picked up. So it is very sensitive, typically more than 95%. Some people will say virtually 100%. This takes time, it's slow, it's labor intensive. Uh, it's one of the kinds of tests that has been backed up in some of these states that are being swamped by COVID. And it's, it's a bit more expensive than other types of tests. What is rising uh, at the moment are antigen tests in terms of uh, uh, potential popularity. They're simple. There's no extraction or amplification steps involved in this. They use another antibody to detect uh, the, the virus itself. The, the, uh, the downside is these tests are less sensitive, a fair bit less sensitive, maybe only 80%. So 80% of the time they'll pick it up if you, if you have the disease. The tests are rapid. They can be done in minutes. They're cheap. They can be scaled up to be done uh, thousands in, in a day, maybe millions in, in a week. Um, these are tests that people are looking to try to potentially make point of care tests. Now, point of care test, uh, just to, to give to tell you exactly what that sort of means is for those of you who have gone to um, a, an urgent care center and they've swabbed your, with symptoms that you thought were flu and you wanted to know whether um, you should be taking Tamiflu or one of the antivirals for flu. They can swab your nose and about five minutes later they'll come back and tell you whether that test showed that you had flu or not. So that's a point of care test. You go to the doctor's office and you not only get the sample taken but you get the result before you leave the office. The other kind of test that's being worked on is what we call a home test kit, essentially. And this is like a home pregnancy test kit. So this is the kind of thing you might even be able to have uh, and test yourself at home. Now, they're going to be, you know, these are works in progress. And so uh, don't, don't go looking for these in the store anytime in the next week or so. So what can we say about uh, the diagnostic tests is that they do have issues. The tests themselves are very good, but they're not perfect. 
And because they're not perfect, we can have problems with things like false negative tests. That's when sensitivity is anything uh, less than 100%. So what's the problem with a false negative test? Well, say your grandson wants to come and visit you in the nursing home and he has a test to see whether or not he's got, uh, he's got COVID so that he's going to act on that. He's gonna, if, he doesn't, if his test is negative, he's going to come visit you. If his test is positive, he's going to stay away. Well, if he has a false negative test, that means he actually does have the virus, but the test tells him he doesn't, and so he's emboldened. He's going to go and he's going to visit you, and trouble ensues. There are all kinds of reasons why we have false negative tests. I'm not going to go into them, but they're there. Uh, similarly, you can have a false positive test. That's when specificity is less than 100%. For example, a false positive test could occur if we had a cross reaction to the, the cold you had two years ago that was a coronavirus, and we're, we're going to interpret that as being a positive test for the current coronavirus. And in fact, it was simply a cross reactivity for, for, for an old infection that you had. So that's, that's one example of how a mistake there can occur. The other e emerging issue with diagnostic tests these days, again, unfortunately, is this continuing availability problems. Limitations of supplies, trained staff, and protective, uh, personal protective gear, PPE. Uh, we thought we had gotten past that particular problem in the earlier first wave, but no, somehow or other we didn't learn the lesson and states that are experiencing huge outbreaks are running into these problems again. Antibody tests, as I said, are, are done in the blood. Uh, the antibody tests, just like the diagnostic tests, are things that the FDA now has to issue what they call an emergency use application, an EUA, as an approval. It's not a technical approval saying they bless this test. It's just, it just means that companies have provided them with enough basic information that the test looks like it is reasonable. There have been a total of 25 different SARS-CoV-2 antibody tests as of the end of last month. This uh, the, the, uh, the FDA's website tracks these for us, and I'm sure there are more in the last two weeks. There are probably another five antibody tests that have come online. Having lots of tests sounds like a good idea, but it also means that there's probably wide variation between whether which ones are, are really more accurate than others. So these tests basically use an antibody to those proteins that I showed you in one of the early slides, that spike. Uh, or the nucleocapsid protein, or both, it can't be. And the tests have good sensitivities, but they're not perfect, and similarly for the specificities. So here's, here's a key problem that we're all facing now, is how should we interpret antibody test results? Uh, unfortunately, it's not straightforward, so we have to be interpreting them quite carefully, particularly for individual test results. A positive antibody test on an individual is evidence of probable SARS-CoV-2 exposure. Now, you could have been exposed and never developed symptoms. So you could have been an asymptomatic uh, disease carrier, so to speak, or you could have had symptoms. Um, and and the, that, that is what that is reflecting. But the problem with interpreting the single antibody test that are available commercially in the lab, and this is all of the ones that I was just referring to, the 25 plus that exist, is that there are other things that need to be known about rather than just it's a positive test or a negative test. We also want to know how high the levels are. That is how high the titers are. And if there are something called neutralizing antibodies, we think that the neutralizing antibodies are really the key, but these are, these are a test, an antibody that can only be measured in a research lab. This is not something Quest or LabCorp or anybody else can do for you. And, and uh, not even if you get on, on your hands and knees, they, they just don't have these tests available. These are research lab tests. So, and we don't know the results of those from, from what they, the, they give you. We also don't know yet what a positive test means regarding immunity from future infection. This requires a special kind of study called a seroprotective survey or a human challenge study. And we just, these things have simply not been done as yet. 
So we don't know how long any apparent immunity from infection will last. So it's not, it's not only whether you will appear to be immune, even for a short period of time, but it's how long, if that immunity does appear, how long will that last? Okay, having said that, uh, the antibody tests appear to be good enough to say that results from testing groups is useful in determining if a population has been exposed or not. So this seroprevalence survey kind of thing, doing a testing on 3,000 people from New York State and determining that 20% of them appear to have been exposed to the virus versus going to Montana and doing another 3,000 people and finding out that only 2% in Montana. Uh, so this, this helps us track the, the, the disease and where it is and where it's been in particular. But it's not telling us good information about the individual. It's telling us about the population. Okay, having said antibody tests are not that great yet, let me just tell you about one study uh, conducted among 148 cases in the US looking at convalescent antibody levels. Okay, so this is 148 people who all had the disease and then they gave blood after they'd recovered. And th they gave it an average of about 39, 39 days after their last symptoms, uh, but some of them were as high as uh, 67 days. Well, the good news was that nearly all had high IgG antibody levels that are shown here. This is the 148 compared to some eight controls, and you can see that that all looks higher. And if you look over here, these are the neutralizing antibodies, and it appears that they all have at least evidence of some neutralizing antibody here. The problem is that you need a certain level of neutralizing antibody, and as it turns out, only two of these 143 cases, the blue and the red, had levels that were consistent with immune, what people would say this looks like immunity. Now, so, so from this study done, this is done at the Rockefeller um, Institute, uh, Rockefeller University, most convalescent plasma samples do not show high levels of neutralizing antibody. That doesn't mean that these people would not be immune, it just means that by this specific measure of immunity uh, and this test, the neutralizing antibodies that we think correlates well with uh, immunity, it, this doesn't seem to show it in this particular population. So take home lessons from this testing bit are the diagnostic tests are very good, but they're not perfect. And they are likely to become much more user friendly in the near future. And that's the point of care and the home test kits that I'm referring to. Antibody tests, the second point is that antibody tests on populations are useful now, but the interpretation of individual test results remains a conundrum. Okay, we're gonna to move to talking about vaccines. And before we talk about vaccines and treatments, I wanna just divert myself for a brief second to show you something about the kind of evidence that we look for when we do uh, scientific studies of new drugs or new vaccines. And this hierarchy shows you the, the lowest level, the weakest evidence coming from case reports all the way up to the top where we've got the randomized controlled trials. And I say this because the FDA is the one that approves drugs and vaccines and the FDA really relies virtually exclusively on randomized controlled trials. Now, there are randomized controlled trials and there are randomized controlled trials. Human clinical trial phases this is also edict from the FDA for drug testing is required for approval by the FDA. And there are three different trial phases, nicely labeled one, two, and three here. Let me just quickly describe these for you. Phase one trials tend to be done in, in small numbers of people, less than 100. They take less than a year and they find the best dose of the drug or the vaccine that has the fewest side effects. So it's a safety endpoint that you're looking at. Phase two is typically done in hundreds, several hundred people. It can take as long and typically does, two years. It, it is further testing of the safety, but you begin to get enough numbers of people that you can start to say something about efficacy or whether it actually works. And finally, we get to phase three, which can be hundreds, but more often is thousands and can be tens of thousands of persons. These typically go one to three years. These confirm and expand everything that we learned in the first two phases but they are also have, doing this as a randomized blinded study. That means, for example, you have 30,000 people, you may randomize 
15,000 of them to receive a placebo, the other 15,000 to receive the drug you're trying to test. So you really have a true comparison group that is randomized so that you believe both the comparison and the treated group actually should be different on all other things that could possibly influence the outcome of this. Now, this is the bad news. Historically, if you include the preclinical testing, and that's the animal studies and the petri dish studies, cell studies that you have to do before you even get to these human studies, drug development typically takes 10 to 15 years and costs a billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. And only 6% of the drugs that start down that pipeline end up ever making it to market. So what makes us think that we're going to be able to develop vaccines for COVID-19 in a year and a half. Well, to make it even worse, this is the sort of the historical uh, chart about vaccine development timelines. I didn't realize it, but polio took 47 years to develop. Chickenpox, 42 years. These are all historical, but, but really, so, so not the 2000s per se. And so here we are saying, we're going to try to get COVID-19 done in 12 to 18 months. It sounds a bit like a pipe dream, doesn't it? However, these are the arguments put forward as to why and how we can expedite the development of these vaccines. One is that we have enormous prior knowledge of coronaviruses, particularly because of these two prior epidemics that have occurred. And nor people have literally launched their careers into studying coronaviruses since then. Second, we've had enormous improvements in sequencing. This, this virus was sequenced in a matter of a few days after it was identified. And that sequence was put on the, on the internet. And suddenly everybody all over the world was basically in the business of designing a vaccine. Advances in bioengineering technologies, I won't go into the details, but enormous things have gone on, nanotechnology and other sorts of things that, that mean that we have all kinds of different ways that we can do things than in the past. Government support and funding, certainly from the US government, has been absolutely unprecedented, but it's been true in other governments elsewhere. And we have a much more shortened testing time. Largely, this shortened testing time is not that they're taking shortcuts. But usually in the past, one would do the phase one study and you pontificate over the results of the phase one and you decide if it's good enough to go on to phase two and then you pontificate over the end of the phase two before you would go into the phase three. They are literally starting things in parallel rather than in sequence. Okay, let's talk a little bit about vaccines. There are over 192 vaccines in development for SARS-CoV-2, including at least 40 at this point that are in some stage of actual human testing. Now developing many vaccines may sound frivolous, but in fact, it's just what we wanna do because using different approaches in multiple different vaccines increases the probability that we're gonna have success. To vaccinate the world, and that's what we really, the target is, it's the whole world. The entire world is, has, has never, been exposed to this vaccine, or been exposed to this virus before. And so we are all uh, basically naive to the virus. We will need more than one effective vaccine. So the hope is we won't be stuck with just one uh, or zero. We'll be stuck with a choice of, 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 well, of riches, that there will be multiple good vaccines. Some of these vaccines may protect us against actually getting the infection. Others may not do that. They may only protect us against getting severe disease, but be, be assured both of those types of vaccines would actually be useful. Okay, there are four fundamental types of vaccines that are in, in the works at the moment. The first is what we just call weakened virus vaccines. These are inactivated or killed. They take the virus and inactivate it or kill it with heat. This is what traditionally we have done with the flu vaccine. So you, you all have received this particular type of vaccine many times, probably most of the vaccines that you and I have had, uh, the childhood vaccines and so on are that. At the moment, only the Chinese companies <clears throat> are the ones pursuing this particular line, but they, they are pursuing a number of these two companies and are pursuing a number of different weakened virus vaccines. There are protein vaccines, and these are uh, vaccines 
against the spike protein that we showed in one of those initial things. And Sanofi and GlaxoKlein-Smith are working on vac vaccines using proteins. There are what are called viral vector vaccines. And this is where you take the SARS-CoV-2 gene and you take a small segment of it, you insert it into an inactive virus like an adenovirus that basically is totally inert in, in our bodies. So it's not going to cause a, a reaction in us. It's just being used as a carrier. So this is being used by AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, and Pan Sino Biologics. And finally, we, uh, we have the uh, genetic code vaccines. This is the ones that are being used are all RNA. So the Moderna, Pfizer, and Inovia are all using this vaccine. But there are many, many vaccines out there. So uh, there are other companies and other entities that are using each of these four things. Now, there is one other non-specific vaccine approach that can be used, and that is old vaccines may be used to boost innate immune systems of the body. For example, BCG was used to try to inoculate people against getting TB. So some countries in the world that have had big TB problems have vaccinated themselves with BCG. And all of us, or virtually all of us, have either had measles or measles vaccine or the oral polio. So there are people that are proposing that we go around and give everybody an oral polio boost, for example. So what are the take home lessons for the moment from the, this vaccine section? Well, we have unprecedented efforts going on worldwide. There are multiple approaches being taken at incredible speed. And I have to believe that we have a very high probability of success. Okay, the last uh, section uh, before unanswered questions is treatment. So let's talk a little bit about this. There are somewhere between 263 and 350 treatments that in the works are being tested. It depends on which one of the databases you look at. Uh, the ones that have, uh, th these are the main classes of them, the antivirals, likely heard of this remdesivir. This is a picture of it. It's an intravenous drug given to patients in the hospital. It has been shown in a randomized trial to be effective and has been approved by the, uh, the FDA as an emergency. Stem cell therapies are, are listed as one of the uh, approaches, and uh, I, I don't quite frankly understand exactly how that would work. It, it currently is only being tried in China at this point in time, not in the US or elsewhere. There are the immune, immune modulating drugs, of which glucocorticoids or dexamethasone are, is one, Con, giving people convalescent plasma, that is this uh, extracting uh, antibodies uh, from the plasma of somebody who got who had COVID-19, but then got better. And, and then there's also monoclonal antibody therapy. This is, this is a very much an up and coming thing and, and you wanna keep your eyes on this. Anti-inflammatory drugs. And then there are the other drugs that have been promoted by uh, various and sundry people like chloroquine and colchicine. Uh, I've highlighted the drugs that have shown some evidence in at least a small study that was a, a control trial, a randomized trial, and that includes uh, remdesivir, uh, dexamethasone, convalescent plasma, and colchicine. Uh, briefly, just to show you a little bit about what the results for the US remdesivir trial showed, uh, this trial took place in 163 hospitalized COVID patients in US, Europe, and Asia. It was a randomized placebo controlled trial, so people were randomized to either receive remdesivir or placebo. People then, uh, the investigators looked to how long it took people to recover or uh, to die if they died. So remdesivir recipients had an average recovery time that took 11 days compared to placebo, 15 days. So it was four days shorter. This difference was statistically uh, different. Uh, the death rates favored remdesivir as well, 8% versus 11.6%. And as of yesterday, there was some new news. They had some additional follow-up. It's now, I think, 8% versus about 12 or 13%. And this difference now is statistically different. But I think what we can say from this is that this is the first study to document benefit of remdesivir in a randomized trial. But it is a modest improvement. It is not a total game changer. It is something that you would want to use but, but again, it's not gonna save everybody and it is, it, is not, it is not a magic wand that's gonna make this disease go away. Okay, so other drugs that have been tested in clinical trials thus far uh, that have shown benefit, I already mentioned dexamethasone, 
convalescent plasma and colchicine. Now, drugs have been tested, certainly, that have failed in, uh, to show any benefit in some of these randomized trials, uh, one of which is uh, chloroquine, in spite of, um, of our president's admonitions. And there was another antiviral combination that was used that also failed to show anything. So there are no guarantees uh, for any of these. That's why we do the randomized trials, so that we have solid evidence to proceed forward on. Okay, so take home lessons from this treatment section are that there are hundreds of drugs being tested. Several effective drugs have been identified already. More will almost certainly follow. And keep your eye on the monoclonal antibody therapies. Okay, uh, we're coming uh, quickly to the end of this. Um, and uh, we're going to ask ourselves, uh, what are the uh, unanswered but yet important questions? Uh, and then a little bit of a look at the future. Okay, why such variability in severity of this disease, all the way from a large number, maybe a third that are asymptomatic to those that are fatal? What about kids? Are kids less susceptible or less reactive than adults? And if so, why is that? Does infection lead to a durable immunity? And if it does, uh, how long is durable? Why do Asian countries have such lower death rates than the West? I've highlighted this because on the next slide, we're gonna to try to look at that in a little bit more detail. Why are females less likely to die than males if they get COVID? Will we find effective vaccines and will they work in the elderly? Will enough of the public accept vaccination? so that we can get to the point of herd immunity, or are we going to end up with one of these never-ending endem endemicity sort of circumstances? Okay, I said we would look a little bit at the, uh, the US and Europe versus Asia, and that's because I think in this particular chart, there has to be some incredible clues. Uh, this is deaths per 100,000 people from COVID, by a bunch of Western countries and then a bunch of Asian countries. And as you can see, the Asian countries really almost don't show up on the chart here. Their rates are so low. On the other hand, there's wide range within the Western countries, uh, with Belgium having been uh, in the uh, indisputable leader in this uh, to their chagrin, I'm sure, and Germany having uh, done a much better job. So this raises all kinds of questions. There, there have to be clues in, in this incredible uh, differences that we see between these two sets of countries. So what are some of the hypotheses one can speculate about in terms of these differences? Well, was there a quicker reaction in, in Asia? I mean, they had the experience of MERS and SARS-1. Maybe their public health system was primed, their pump was primed to be able to jump all over this. What about prior population exposure to coronavirus? Again, that same part of the world had prior exposure to COVID, uh, COVID uh, SARS COVID uh, one. So maybe there was just enough there that that has allowed them to avoid the the deaths uh, from this that that we're experiencing in the West. Many people have talked about the weather. Hotter weather is is where the virus goes to die. Uh, but we've got countries on both sides of the equator. It doesn't, doesn't seem to have panned out. Uh, certainly the hotter weather has not made the uh, epidemic go away in the U.S. People have observed that people in the Andes and in the Himalayas seem to have lower rates. Does that mean altitude is, is a possible effect? Age of the population. Um, many of the Asian countries have younger populations, but one need only look at Japan to, to, as one of the oldest countries in the world to see that, that you can punch a hole in that hypothesis, or at least that doesn't explain everything. Hygiene habits. Asia is not so keen on shaking hands and other sort of things. I, I think the Japanese are renowned for their uh, cleanliness habits. Does that make a difference? Maybe. Some of these countries have universal health care but some of the Western countries also have universal health care. So it's a little hard to figure exactly where that fits in the spectrum. Mutation of the virus. 
In fact, there has been mutation of the virus, even though, as I said, the virus went both east and west when it left China. <clears throat> the virus that ended up in Italy it ended up being a variant that, uh, as it's being studied, uh, the population science people think that this virus has become uh, uh, a better spreading virus. That mutation hasn't made it more deadly, but it has made it uh, uh, so that it spreads more easily. Genetic factors, almost certainly there have to be some genetic factors in, involved in all of this. Uh, we know that there was a recent study, for example, that talked about blood group type and showed that people who had type A uh, blood had a greater risk than people that had, uh, than, than other blood groups. And people that had type O blood group seemed to be at reduced risk. So that's one of <clears throat> a huge array of potential genetic factors that uh, can and will be looked at, I'm very sure. BCG vaccination. I alluded to this earlier. Some of the countries, particularly in Asia, have had tuberculosis problems and have used BCG vaccination campaigns nationwide. That may have some effect. What about obesity? Well, America pretty much ranks at the top of the obesity scale, so that fits. Uh, Asian countries tend to have people that are much less obese. All of those things together may, make, may help us explain this, but these all merit being explored. And of course, there's always the possibility that differences that we're looking at may be due to chance. Okay. Um, what about the future? Well, the answer is vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. We won't be back to anything resembling normal until we've been vaccinated. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here to kind of give you timetables for the leading vaccine candidates among some 17 firms that are now doing human testing. The World Health Organization <clears throat> believes that the Oxford-AstraZeneca viral vector vaccine is the, uh, the lead dog in the pack at the moment. They currently have three of the phase three trials ongoing, one in the UK, one in Brazil, and one in South Africa. They're planning to start a US trial in September, and they're reportedly saying that early results from the first of these phase three trials could be available as soon as August. Now, the other part of this whole vaccine development uh, issue is, uh, are we going to be able to make enough of this fast enough and get it distributed uh, to really make a difference? Well, the uh, AstraZeneca group has made agreements to supply a billion doses collectively to the EU, the UK, US, and Gavi, which will be for some of the uh, uh, undeveloped part of the world. And they have an agreement with the Serum Institute of India to make that vaccine uh, with a promise of making a billion doses, including 400 million even by the end of this year. So that sounds like a lot, but again, we've got the whole world to deal with. Uh, Sinopharm <clears throat> is the lead Chinese firm using the, a killed virus vaccine. They're in late stage testing. There's not a lot of information about the Chinese firm's reports. The um, newspaper reports that we get really focus much more on the Western uh, pharmaceutical companies. This is the uh, local vaccine, the, uh, the, the, the vaccine that you hear Tony Fauci talking about, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease developed a vaccine that Moderna, the drug company Moderna is making, it's the RNA vaccine. This uh, was created at NIH in 66 days and developed into production by Moderna. Uh, the phase two trial there is still ongoing. Phase three, I heard just this evening on the news, literally um, 30 minutes before we uh, started, that they're going to start that trial on July 27th. They're targeting recruitment of 30,000 persons. And they are on track to make, or so they say, 500 million to a billion doses a year. So again, big numbers, the kind of numbers though that we're gonna need. BioNTech, which is a German company located in Mainz, Germany, is working with Pfizer on an RNA vaccine. Their phase three trial will also start the end of July. They are also targeting 30,000 persons. They are also partnering with uh, Shanghai Fosun Pharmaceutical to quickly produce huge amounts of vaccine, uh, unspecified amounts, at least in, in the papers at this point. 
uh, Johnson & Johnson is working on a viral vector vaccine and they uh, have announced that they're planning to start phase three trial, their phase three trial in September. So a little bit behind the others, but not far. And finally, uh, Anovia has an R RNA vaccine uh, that has had positive phase one results that have actually been reported. Uh, I believe they're in phase two at this point, but again, there's, there's less press about them at this point. So in summation for this, I think the take home is sort of expect efficacy results from upwards of four to six leading vaccine candidates by late fall, or at the latest by the end of this calendar year. Okay, uh, a little bit more on the future. Where are we going with treatments? Um, we can expect improved delivery of antivirals. For example, remdesivir, as I mentioned earlier, is an IV drug. That means you have to be in hospital to get it. Their remdesivir, the company uh, Gilead uh, Pharmaceuticals, is working on a nasal spray for remdesivir. So that could theoretically be given to people as an outpatient. It should be given as an outpatient. It could be given, therefore, earlier in, in the process. And so it could almost become like a prevention of getting severe disease sort of thing. Um, there are, there's another oral preparation that has very similar action to remdesivir that looks quite positive. Being able to take an oral preparation as opposed to having to go into hospital to get an IV would also move things along. You would be able to take that at home. It's highly likely that we'll identify other effective drugs among the hundreds I, I, I sort of alluded to being tested. And there'll be other leads that come from sequencing convalescent plasma, including these monoclonal antibodies that, that I mentioned. Unfortunately, until the vaccines are available and in, in, in our bodies, um, we must fall back on what we know works, uh, painful though it may be, and that's mitigation. So we need to continue mitigation until effective vaccines are available and widely distributed and accept it. Uh, in the meantime, for goodness sakes, get your flu vaccine this season as soon as it's available. That's the end of the scientific slides. I did, however, want to end on a slightly lighter note and being um, consistent with um, the fact that we're all uh, church-going people. I, uh, I received um, a series of what somebody called COVID funnies, uh, little cartoons or, or uh, pithy statements that uh, related to the COVID situation. And uh, five of these uh, really were signed uh, statements that were posted in front of churches. So I thought I would share those with you. Uh, the first here says, had not planned on giving up quite this much for Lent. The second says, Jesus rode an ass into Jerusalem. Keep yours at home. Prophecy class canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. This too shall pass. It might pass like a kidney stone, but it's gonna pass. And finally, people keep asking, is COVID-19 really that serious? Listen up, casinos and churches are closed. When heaven and hell agree on the same thing, it's probably pretty serious. That is it. So, um, Phil, you know that this is us um, clapping for you, right? I, I, I thought perhaps uh, some acute spasm had overtaken you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I think um, if Phil is ready for it, I think we've in entered the uh, question and musing um, time of the um, uh, presentation. So if you have yeah. um, a question, if you know how to raise your hand, um, good job, Arlene and Sharon. Um, you can um, put your question in the chat feature um, and if none of those things work for you, then um, wave violently when somebody else isn't talking. And not talking you. Um, so Arlene and Sharon, since you guys have got your hand up, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? 
Okay, it's my question, and it is, uh, is it better to wash your hands with soap uh, or use a hand sanitizer? Because your, your slides did mention wash hands, but I'm wondering. Yeah. No, I, th I think, uh, well, better that you do something than nothing, but better that you wash with soap for the full 20 seconds. I mean, basically soap will break down the barriers. So, so you know, you don't, the fact that Purell is uh, either sold out, I think, I think it's another year before you can actually buy the Purell brand. I mean, other brands have come online, but you know, their, Purell's contracts were all with, um, by and large, they were with uh, the medical establishment and hospitals. And I think they have chosen to preferentially continue to supply them. But those are not bad, but they are not as good as, as, as the appropriate procedures used with soap. Thanks, Bill. So Michelle Kanick wants to know if um, we should be wearing gloves. Uh, I'm sorry, who said gloves? Gloves. Uh, Do you so, like gloves? You mean like you mean like full time, or what are we talking about here? Um, how is important is it to wear gloves or to not wear gloves? Like, do you feel like it's a, a helpful thing for us to be doing? Uh, I guess it depends a little bit on how often you wash your hands uh, and where you are. Uh, I don't have a. I mean, Marie and I use gloves when we go to the grocery store, for example. That is what Michelle wanted to know. Does Phil use? Right, Michelle, that's what you wanted to know. Does Phil use gloves at the grocery store? Think yeah, that's because, you know, I'm, I'm fully on board with the mask idea. Um, but I've heard conflicting things about, for instance, how long the virus can hang around on surfaces. So if you're not touching your face and you're just touching things, does it, do you have to wear gloves? Well, look, we don't know what the, uh, the people in the grocery store, in our grocery store, are wearing masks, and most of the time they're wearing gloves, the ones I see. <clears throat> so, except for the fact that, of course, if you touch a contaminated surface, then your glove is going to be transmitting that as well. So, um, I, I, don't, I don't see the gloves as, and I don't see the surface. I see that as much lower down on the, on the infection chain uh, as, as a source. Than the, the, the I think gloves are as effective as washing your hands. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, to go on with the protection part of thing, Deb Marks wants to know if glasses count as eye protection. Do glasses count as eye protection? Uh, they do, um, but but they are they are not uh, sealed around the edges. And uh, for those of us that uh, like smaller glasses, uh, that's probably fine. But if you like Sarah's glasses with the big lenses, <clears throat> she probably has more protective eyeglasses than some of the rest of us are wearing. Thank you. Ravens. Um, and Jack and Margie want to know about um, the steroid treatment that was talked about. Um, you know what, um, Phil, does the steroid treatment ring a bell with you? Yes. Uh, a large study done at uh, Oxford in the UK among hospitalized COVID patients showed that dexamethasone, which has been around forever, um, is uh, it's anti-inflammatory. It's a it's a steroid. It's it's uh, it would uh, it's used often for brain swelling and things like that. If you're a if you're a uh, a neurosurgery patient, for example, uh, that that <coughs> uh, improves your survival in hospital, and it it it's not it's it's been fully approved for so long that it's it's an off the shelf thing. There's no new FDA approval that's required, and that that we're always glad to find those kind of things. Uh, that work because you don't have to go through any of the FDA hoops. Mm -hmm. Chad's got his hand up. Chad wants, to, uh, okay. He, he's having a fit or the bird is one or the other. I don't know. <laughs> uh, last week I read a, uh, a piece uh, that was estimating the numbers uh, of infections you were not, uh, the numbers of morbidities that you were talking about earlier, uh, assuming a 1% fatality rate mm -hmm. in the country. And uh, I did some fast math, uh, assuming that a person would only get one of those morbidities at a time. And uh, at 1%, 
the total was something like in the in the U.S. 150 million cases. Uh, that's uh, lung disease, permanent lung disease, permanent heart disease, and all the rest uh, that might be permanent or temporary. But they, when I told up the number that was uh, numbers that were calculated as a function of the 1% mortality rate it came up to about 150 million. Uh, question is, do you know anything about uh, the morbidity rates, assuming something about fatalities? And if so, what do you know about it? No, you, you've mixed uh, morbidity and mortality in your, in your discussion. I haven't seen that specific uh, article, but um, I, I sh talked about a 4%, 4.5% case fatality ratio. And that's just taking the crude number of, of deaths divided by the total number of cases. Uh, the actual estimate is closer to uh, when, when you actually uh, age adjust across populations and so on, it begins to look a lot more like like one percent, which is the number you were you were citing, but when you get when you get into four percent, four percent. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. Yes, one percent. Sorry. Yes. I think that. I mean, that's still a that's ten times more than what flu does. So that's still a devastating percent and and a big problem. Um, you know the. I, 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 I would be getting off into territory that I'm not as familiar with by trying to talk about the comorbidities uh, that, are, that are occurring. If you have a heart attack and die from it, then you, you know, you, it's gonna be called, a, is it gonna be called a COVID death or is it gonna be called a, a cardiac death? Uh, and so, so all of that's gonna get uh, a little bit more confusing. So I think you, um, I think you just have to wait for that to shake itself out. We don't know what long-term consequences are. For example, Chad, you asked me the other day, I think if, uh, if you lose your sense of smell, is it gonna come back? Um, well, you know, it's, it appears that it's an inflammation and it probably will go away, but you know, we haven't had enough cases followed long enough to really know what the true natural history of that particular symptom is. Uh, if you have a really uh, bad, if you have a stroke, uh, from, from COVID, uh, the consequences of that stroke are gonna be with you. you. You may or may not die from it. If you don't die, you're gonna have to live with the consequences. So I, I think we just don't know uh, all of this, the side effects that are less than fatal side effects and whether some of those are going to sort of repair themselves, if you will, and, and it will be better at the end of the day. Well, a concern I have about that is that People have a tendency to talk about the number of deaths a day per week per month, uh, but there's very little comment about morbidity, which is hugely greater. And for those of us who are in of a certain age, uh, it matters a great deal. No, no, you're absolutely right. It's just that deaths are countable. Uh, and, we were, and there will be, they will be revamping death counts and that, <laughs> over time. And there will be a sickness for a um, So, um, Phil, yeah, Bob, Bob. Phil uh, let me, could I just play in a minute? Number one, thank you for what's a terrific presentation. And number two, to put a pessimistic note on your uh, hope for vaccines, having worked for a while for the pharmaceutical industry. You're talking about, if I had a, if my company had a supposed vaccine ready for phase three on September 1, and I went in, I wanted 30,000 people to, to volunteer for a phase three trial. Uh, we're not gonna get that on September 1. We're very, very fortunate to get 30,000 people by the end of September more likely October, November, and then you've got months before you see, is this really keeping people from getting the vac from getting the disease? It's the fact they've had the vaccine, they don't have it a week later, doesn't mean that they're not gonna get it. So I, I think you're talking about phase three trials taking far longer than you were talking about. 
That's just my opinion. But I uh, just wanted to throw that into the conversation. That, that's, that's entirely possible, Bob. But there are some other things playing uh, very much in favor of all this. There's huge interest. There is a website that just went up last week that's uh, a place where you can basically call in or write in to begin to, to offer yourself as a volunteer for some of these things. And one of the things that happens with all this is that it depends very much on where you pick to, to do the, uh, the recruitment from. Now, if, um, where, if you try to do this vaccine trial in New Zealand, well, New Zealand just uh, cured its last case last week. So that study would go on that you could randomize everybody in New Zealand and you still, and for five years, and you, you wouldn't get a result. But if you go into the hot spots where the virus is active, and that's exactly where they have to go, you have to look at the statistics of this. What, hap what, what, what the deal is, is it depends on how many endpoints you get. You, if you have 100 endpoints, if you have 100 people among this 30,000, well, it doesn't even have to be 30,000. It could be, you say you randomize uh, even 500 people the first week. If 100 of those 500 people get uh, the, the virus, get sick and, and are tested and, and are proven to, to have the, the disease, and you get uh, 90 of those cases are in the placebo group and 10 of them are in the vaccine group, that's gonna be a statistically significant difference. And you're gonna be hard pressed not to stop that trial at that point. And it will be enough information, or at least to think seriously about breaking the randomization and doing something else. So there are scenarios in which this could work out rather quickly. Now I can't, obviously I can't guarantee that's gonna happen, but, but I, I Everything about this is so compressed, it, it boggles the mind. As I say, that one chart that looks at 47 years for a, you know, past uh, polio vaccine or something like that, and now we're talking, it, 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 is, uh, it, it, it beggars the imagination. Um, all right, so I just need to do a little bit of, Betsy, I see your hand up. Kathy, I see your hand up. Ian and John, do you guys have a question? I see that you're unmuted and I just wanted to check, do you have a question? Um, and John, oh. Okay, and um, Deb, does your question about um, long, you know, how we just talk about, you know, um, getting it and dying from it, but like there's that whole gray. So do you feel like Phil adequately answered that question or would you like more information about um, the -term terrible consequences of COVID-19? If other people understood it better than I did, then I'll just email Phil later. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, like I struggle straight up with um, what the difference between morbid morbidity and whatever the other one is. I'm like, I don't, I don't even know what those. Are. So yeah, morbidity, um, morbidity is anything that doesn't kill you. It okay, causes you a health problem. Mortality uh -huh. is death. Okay, so that that one? Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Okay. okay. All right. I think I can get that one down. Yeah, um, so, down. Um, um, so Betsy and then Kathy. Um, Phil, I went to the CDC website, mm -hmm. and um, they said that if you, particularly for seniors, that we should not get the flu vaccine until September or October because it tends to lose its effectiveness. Um, do you think it would, and I, my thought was, wow, okay, wait till September, but then everybody's going to be running to get it. So maybe it is better to get it as soon as possible. Do you have thoughts about that? So even if it loses, well, first of all, I get it as soon as I can get it. So I, I, I have often gotten it the first week in August when I'm stumbling through the, the uh, Rite yep. Aid pharmacy or whatever it is, and they had their little sign up. And I just say, you know, why wait? Yep. Even if the antibody levels go down a, a little, if you are challenged with the actual virus, it you know, you've developed cells that have memory for that. So I, I, uh, you may still, you may get it, but it may be not as severe. But having had that vaccine, I, my sense is uh, you, it, it benefits you for uh, probably closer to a year, at least six months, but closer to a year. And yeah, it may vacillate some and it may vacillate only in one direction, but I would still get that out of the way. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, I just wanted to go back to what Bob was concerned about, and Phil, maybe you could sort of add in on this um, in terms of the um, the uh, the time that it's going to take for these vaccines to really get rolling and produced. So one good thing that the government did was to uh, to take a lot of money, right? They, they're funding the production and the manufacturing of these vaccines as we speak. So that is unprecedented, but all of these, uh, I know Pfizer's doing this, Moderna, they're all, in, they're all starting, especially if they've been through the, through the phase one, two, two trials, they have a really good idea of, of what ones are really working already. And so they're, they're taking a huge chance on our tax dollars, but that's okay with me. They're actually producing as we speak. And so they're making that, that scientific uh, assumption um, the, from, from the data that they have. So when they talk about uh, getting through phase three and, uh, turning, um, and turning this over into actual vaccines that can be given to people there, they will have them already produced and stockpiled. And if some of them don't show to be effective, well then, you know, it's, it's their loss and some of ours too. But that's, that's I think, one of the main reason why this can actually be done by the end of the, the year. The other thing um, is that uh, my husband is, um, uh, he is in the phase two Pfizer trial right now. Um, that's being done through NIH up at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore. And uh, he just went for another blood draw today. Um, and um, the, the PI was, um, was saying that they're, they're fairly sure that their phase three is gonna start very soon and, and they're, they're, the numbers are looking very good. Um, of course, in another, we'll have to wait a couple of weeks to find out if he actually got the placebo all this time, but nevertheless, we're hoping that that works. Um, but they were talking about how these phase three, 30,000 for Moderna, I've signed up for that one. They are, Moderna as an example of all the rest of them, they are aggressively uh, seeking volunteers for this. I mean, this is like a huge, huge effort across the country. They're, they're targeting high-risk populations. They're down in Florida. They're down in, I mean, there's, there's even signs up uh, at, at metro stops around here, you know, saying, you know, sign up for these trials. If you sign up for those, you'll get picked by probably any of these. I mean, so they're really, really, um, you know, we hear what you say, Bob, but this is, I mean, this is just an unprecedented level of, of effort in getting people to do the right thing. And the other, the other point that you made, Kathy, I just emphasize is that the government's put a huge amount of money in this and they're going to develop these vaccines. If, if for example, a phase three one doesn't work, that doesn't mean they won't have 500 million doses sitting ready anyway. And that mm -hmm. is, they're part of this doing it uh, with a warp speed as, as the program's called, right? So, yeah. Oh, Betsy? Betsy has another question. Oh, of course, I have a million. Have, do you have any sense of how the decision will be made about which countries get the virus, I mean, the vaccine first? I mean, we always think it's going to be us, but, you know, maybe the German one wins. I, I uh, only know that they say, you know, for example, uh, the... Uh, the uh, uh, Oxford vaccine, for example, that the commitment to the EU and to the US and Gabby and so uh, they, there are very high-minded statements that go out about being sure that the developing world uh, gets uh, their fair share. And of course, uh, Africa is in the middle of a surge with all of this at the, at, at the moment. And, and Brazil. Brazil, and I guess Brazil is still officially called a developing country, so, but uh, their problem is, is more politics, it seems like, at the moment down there than it is uh, uh, their own uh, talents and so on. But uh, I think, um, you know, there's also the question of who gets it first within country? Yeah. Uh, is it going to be healthcare workers? Is it going to be the military? Uh, is it going to be cronies? <laughs> uh, whatever. <laughs> oh, um, I, so, so I, I don't, I, I, I can see that there, you know, if there's tons and tons of it and they're all for different vaccines and they all seem to work, then elbows don't have to get nearly as sharp. I, I, I don't know the level of which, you know, negotiations spell those kind of things out. I'm sure there will be arm wrestling and mm -hmm. uh, back scratching going on. 
uh, at some level. Thank you. I see that you have a question. Wait, I gotta unmute you. Okay. Hi, I just wanted to check and see. It seems like the number of people dying has not gone up that much, even though the cases have been skyrocketing for a while. It appears that we're getting better at managing the disease. Is that true? And if so, kind of what? Like, for example, the ventilators, they found out those are kind of like not working as well as they thought they might. I don't know. So, so actually, I think the fact that deaths haven't gone up yet is, is, is an artifact. And it is, uh, at this point, at least that's my best guess. Uh, first and foremost, most of the people are, are a large number. A larger number of people have been young in the current surge. But the problem is that those young people that have it um, have interrelationships with older people. And so I think it's almost like it's going to be, it's going to take more than the usual two week interval. It may be more like a month later, for example. So I, if we go a month, six weeks from now, and that surge in the cases hasn't yet translated into uh, a much more ri evident rising surge in deaths, <clears throat> then it may be uh, that... But you, but you haven't really noticed any change that the protocol has changed for we're getting better at managing this. No, no, we, no we are getting better at managing it. I, I don't disagree with that. Um, okay. okay. Well, that but, but I don't think that that's enough to uh, keep deaths from surging if older people in the states where the younger people have gotten it because of the, the beach activity and the, uh, the things opening up. Is, is I think it's going to be overcome by, by it's just going to get swamped, I think. So this makes me want to go back to Deb's question that just because the death rate is not going up with the infection rate, it, to me that just means that more people are living with the long-term consequences of it. And so, um, like, do most people make a moderately full recovery? Well, you know, the ones we see on uh, TV are the ones who uh, come off ventilators after two months and, uh, you know, they're lucky to be alive sorts of things. Uh, the majority, you know, the people, um, as I described from the original Chinese data, it's 81% have mild. And I think those people make full recoveries, except for some of those isolated, severe, you know, like the exhaustion syndrome sorts of things. Uh, but the, the bigger the experience, <laughs> The, more, the longer this goes, the more people that get it, the more we start seeing uh, enough accumulation of the more unusual things. And those unusual things are not trivial. They're, they're a disaster if they happen to you, potentially. Um, who hmm. wants a heart attack? Who wants uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome? That's, that, this isn't anything anybody signs up for. But I think that we, uh, we will... Um, you know, and some of it is, I think, you know, the, the reporters that are writing articles about this have probably gotten tired about talking about ventilator cases and they want, they want to move on and talk about the rare, they're looking for a new angle on things. And that's not bad. I'm not, I don't want to be castigating them for, for trying to pick something that'll, that'll, uh, they can get their name on the front page of the newspaper too. But I think there's some of that. You know, there, this is going to be, there's going to be so much material to study from all of this. Uh, and it's such a big deal. Uh, this is going to keep scientists working uh, full time, uh, long past when we've settled on vaccines and, and other sorts of things. There's just a huge amount, and some things we're, we're you know are not going to be the uh, early effects. What what if what if there's a one year delayed? You know we haven't had the disease around long enough to have any idea about what might pop up a year down the pipeline. Is this a virus that's like? Um, herpes that hangs around in the body or the chicken pox virus and comes out and, and, and gives us, you know, the, the, the pain syndrome, uh, whatever. Uh, we, we don't know whether this virus goes completely away or it remains dormant. Any other flailing of hands or questions? Bob has his finger on the button. It looks like it may be the off button. <laughs> Bob, are you getting ready to hang up on us or do you want to say something? You're muted. You're muted. Hold on. 
Bobby can't hear you. Bobby can't hear you. Bobby can't hear you. I just wanted to thank Phil again one more time for the, what was really a terrific, very informative presentation. It was fantastic you did that. Well, thank you for the invite. Thanks for listening. And the questions? Um, I Are would you? like, go ahead. Somebody had a question? I was just going to ask him if he pushed the record button so that this is going to be recorded and people who weren't able to come can, um, can access it. I have recorded it and I'll get it up on the church YouTube site. Like. Terrific. About, well, it'll probably be tomorrow at lunchtime, but I'll get it done. Okay. Yes. Terrific. Thank you, too. Thank you, Jessica, for making all these things possible. And, and Phil, uh, it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. So if it's okay with you guys, um, some of you have joined us, and I'm not sure what your tradition is, but since we're praying, I'd like for us to end in prayer, especially since that was a little off, and so I'd like for us to end with prayer to hopefully help us find some sleep tonight. So let us pray. O Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes. The busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in thy mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. <laughs>